The mountains will move every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. There is hope within the fight, in the wars that rage inside. Though the shadows steal the light. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Oh, nothing is. Possible. Hey, guess what? We're going to do it again this week. If you would give your attention to the baptistry where Al Segris is going to baptize his daughter, Hannah. Morning. This is Hannah, Lauren Segrist. Um, it's very fitting that she's going to make this change in her life today. Uh, because tomorrow she starts sixth grade at a new school, going to middle school. Um, and so she's going to arm herself to do that in front of y'all and, and in front of God. So, Hannah, before we do this, i got to ask you one very important question, which is do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? I do. I know that you do. And because of that confession, I will now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. I want to hold your nose. Well, that is awesome. Awesome. Hey, good morning. Welcome. What a great way for us to start this morning. And a good reminder, school starting. Look, I know, I know that you're upset about it. I know you've been dreading it. Teachers. But it's okay because the kids are upset too, right? Parents, tomorrow, noon, office, party, okay? <laughs> Come join us. We'll have a good time. Hey, we're going to have a special prayer later on for our kids and going back to school, our teachers and administrators, but that's just a great way for us to begin this morning. If, if our baptisms ask, raise any questions for you, we would love to talk about that and have a conversation about that with you. The uh, Bible says a lot about it, and we try to follow the Bible as closely as we can, so we'd love to have that conversation. Here's another neat thing we're going to do this morning. Nathan and Kara Smeal are with us this morning, and they have their brand new baby boy, Oliver. So let's give them a welcoming hand. And we're going to have a prayer with them right here. You guys come on over. Let's pray. Hold him up and let us see him. Handsome little guy. God, thank you so much for... Just the neat way we get to begin this morning, to witness a birth in Christ, and now we get to celebrate a birth into life with Oliver. Uh, we're thankful that he's healthy. We're thankful that you were with Kara all through her pregnancy. We're thankful that this little boy's been born into a Christian family, a mom and a dad who love each other and love you, and a heritage of faith on both sides. And God, we lift Oliver up to you this morning. It's a dangerous world into which he's been born. In many ways, it's a world that's not very friendly to faith. And so we pray for Nathan and Kara that they will raise him in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray, Father, that we will be his church and that we will surround both Oliver and his mom and his dad with support, 
and examples. We pray that he will always see and hear in us your glory and that we will live before him an example. And we take seriously the responsibility this little boy brings to us. And we want to do everything we can to help him grow up to be a man of God. Bless Nathan and Kara with wisdom as they raise him. Help them know when to say yes and when to say no, when to say nothing at all, when to withhold, when to give. Just give them great wisdom as parents. Bless their marriage. Bless their family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, can I get you guys to uh, come on back up, Lincoln? One more thing I want to uh, share with you this morning. We are welcoming in some new members to Twickenham, and so I want to have these folks just kind of stand so you can see who they are. Uh, Robert and Kimberly Dudley right back here. You guys stand up and give them a big hand. Welcome. Glad you guys are here. And we got uh, Jason and Amanda Colburn. Amanda's right here, and Jason's... They don't sit together. <laughs> they, act, they actually do. He just didn't know where she was. They have Ada, Willa, Micah, and this is the second little girl I think we've got named Georgia. So that's, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> Barbara McDaniel. Where's Barbara? Barbara's back. There he is. There's Barbara back here. Welcome. Rick and Laura Segrist. Where are Rick and Laura? Right here. Glad to have you guys. That's Charlie, Libby, and John Isaac are their kids. And then Daniel and Hillary Williams. Where are you guys? Daniel and Hillary, are you here? Well, give them a hand anyway. So there we go. Hey, let's stand up and praise the Lord together. Glad you're here this morning. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign. than gold. They are sweeter than honey. By them your servant is warned. But who can discern their own errors? Keep your servant also from willful sins. Then I will be blameless. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my God, and my Redeemer. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us. In your likeness, that the light of Christ may be seen today in our acts of love and 
Here's my heart. 
time of communion together this morning, we are reminded of the purity that you have shared to us through the pure sacrifice of your son for us. As we have spoken of so many times in recent weeks, not for anything that we have done. And so now, Lord, we continue to speak what is true as we take this bread and this cup and we offer our thanks for it, as we share it together, coming to the table as a family to remember that sacrifice for us. This is our prayer as we enjoy this time of communion together in Jesus' name, amen. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Come to the table. Let's take the bread. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with Come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation. Receive from his nail scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation. Drink of the blood. To the table of mercy, 
Prepared with the wine and the bread All who are hungry and thirsty Come and your souls will be fed Why don't you come, come at the Lord's invitation Receive from his nail-scarred love him and for those who want to love him more. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. Come to the table. Let's share the cup.
Touch my lips with holy fire and make me more like you. Cause you alone can rescue me. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. Cause you alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can from the grave you came down to find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise to you alone belongs the highest praise and oh I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. The light of the world forever reigns. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your Light of the world forever reigns. Light of the world forever reigns. Be seated. Man, Lincoln, we have we have some amazing worship here. I just you you do an awesome job. No matter what Jody says here in a few minutes, um, I am just here to give you guys a quick update from the vision committee. Um, we have met twice now, and I, I just want to be so complimentary of the whole committee and the job the elders did in selecting folks. Um, we did our research reports, reports, we had subcommittees that are really looking at what does this area, um, what does our world look like, what does our country look like, what does Huntsville, Alabama look like in 2040, and um, just, just really want to commend the amount of research and time that everybody ought to obviously put into that. Um, John, uh, the facilitator that, that the elders chose, just doing a great job of leading us through. And uh, keep this short, but, but we just we want you guys to know what's happening. We want you to know that we're talking, and we don't want any of this to be sort of this, uh, you know, secret society of the vision committee that, that, that we're figuring stuff out and, and we're going to come tell you what kind of church you need to be in a few years. We really want it to be truly the vision that this church has. And so we have two uh, needs from the congregation right now. Uh, first and foremost, we need prayer. Um, we need this whole effort covered in prayer. We need you to be praying just, you know, through the week as you say your prayers. Just remember the committee as one of the groups that need your prayer right now. But specifically, we've got to sign up for 15-minute intervals. Um, you can see when we're meeting, and uh, we've got a sign-up that's available presumably on our website and email that you receive or will receive shortly, where we want you guys to go out and we want you to sign up for those 15-minute blocks. And while we're together as a group, we want to know that we are covered the whole time uh, by your prayers. So please do that. Um, second need that we have is your input. Um, we, we are intent that this is to be the vision for the Twickenham Church, not the vision that comes out of this committee. And so um, the process that we're going to use is called an appreciative inquiry, and it is going to be on August 18th in the morning, and it is going to be on September 9th. Uh, the first one is a Saturday. September 9th is a Sunday. And you should have received a letter about th that this week. Um, if, if it wasn't clear in the letter, the goal of this is, I want to get the exact word, it is a positive discussion about what God has in store for Twickenham's long-term future. And so what John is going to do is he's going to walk us through some exercises 
we're going we're gonna to break off into groups, and you're going to talk with that group about some stuff, and then we're going to mix her up, and you're going to go talk with another group about some stuff. And, and he said, the time you will blink and it will pass, and you will just go, wow, have we really been here working on this? Because it's the, the type of energy that you get out of talking about the future in a positive way is just, it's uplifting, and you, get a, you, you will get a lot out of this. Um, and what, what we will come out of, of this with as a committee is a clear picture of what this congregation sees that God is wanting for the future of Twickenham. And so we really want you to come. We're going to feed you, and, uh, and we just really need you to be there and participate. We're going to work on kids and all kinds of things. So please come. Thanks, guys. I, I really want to urge you to, to be a part of those, those two, uh, one of those two events, that Saturday or that Sunday. There's an information in, in the bulletin about that for you. 20 years ago, around 98 and 2000, that's, except for you guys, that seemed like that went like that, right? 20 years is going to be here before we know it. And so we got to be thinking, praying, dreaming, imagining now for what this church is going to be in 20 years. And you know what? The truth is some of us won't be here then. Okay, we won't be. The Lord will call us home. We'll move, whatever. But our kids, our grandkids, our friends are going to be a part of this church then. And we now get the opportunity to imagine together what that's going to be like. I'm, I'm begging you, let your voice be a part of this conversation. If you're not a part of this conversation, something really important might be left out. So look at those two dates, that Saturday, that Sunday. It's a big ask, four hours, big ask. We're all really busy, right? But, but do it. It's worth it. It's the future of this church. It's the future of Twickenham. It's the future of Huntsville. So let's get in there and do it. Okay, I'm going to tell you, look in Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to tell you three quick stories, okay? And they're, they're about marketing, but they're, they're better than they sound, right? And their connection to each other will be obvious, but their connection to our faith will seem like, I don't really see at first, but trust me, they're connected. So you've heard of J.C. Penney. A lot of you have heard of J.C. Penney, probably been in Penney's right before. I think they're not doing so well these days. Unless you're from Kansas City, Missouri, you've probably never heard of J.C. Nichols. J.C. Nichols. Depending on whether you like to shop, you should either have a framed portrait of J.C. Nichols hanging in the foyer at home, or you should wish curses of biblical proportion down on his descendants if you don't like to shop. So out of curiosity, how many like to shop? Just, I've asked this before, but I forgot. What are, okay, not, there are not many of us that like to shop. Okay? How many of you would rather be covered in honey and staked to a fire ant hill than shop? Because that's... <laughs> More of you, all right? I love to shop, I do. I'm just telling you right now, I love to shop. I don't like to buy, but I love to shop. I love to shop specifically in malls. You get the same effect in Walmart, maybe a little bit better these days in Walmart, but I love to go to malls because after about an hour, I walk out feeling better about myself than when I went in. Because <laughs> especially Walmart, if I spend an hour in Walmart and I come out going, I am Mr. Universe, right? <laughs> So I just love to watch people, and in my heart, I sometimes laugh at them. I shouldn't do that, but I do, because sometimes people are funny. Here's how J.C. Nichols figures into that. Back in 1907, J.C. Nichols started buying up land outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Started buying up undeveloped land. And people thought he was nuts, because it was all pig farms. But he was, it was cheap, he started buying it up, and, and they, they called it Nichols Folly. Nichols Folly foolishness until 1922. Because by 1922, other people had bought land out there and had begun to develop it, and they, it was high-end development, and Nichols opened the very first mall in the United States, the Country Club Plaza, and it exploded. He made more money than anybody in the whole world almost. He just, he just did really, really well with that. And here's the thing. The Country Club Plaza is still open to this day. The critics are all dead. 
the Country Club Plaza is still open and you can go there and visit the museum and everything. Okay, so I want you to remember the mall. Got it? How many of you have ever shopped in a Piggly Wiggly? Okay. <laughs> Let's just say it together because it's fun. One, two, three. Piggly Wiggly. All right. This is kind of fun to say. Here's where Piggly Wiggly figures into this, all this uh, stuff about marketing and things. They were the first grocery store to permit shoppers to pull their own items off the shelf. Before Piggly Wiggly came up with that idea, you walked into the store, handed the clerk your list, or just told the clerk what you wanted, and they went and got your stuff and brought it to the counter, and then you took it home. Here's what Piggly Wiggly said. You know, they said, you know what? We could cut labor costs if we let the people get their stuff themselves, and then we could lower prices and be more competitive in the market. And so that's what they did. Now, here's the really weird thing about the funny thing, the ironic thing about that is some of you this week sent your list to the grocery store and then either went and picked it up or the really lazy ones among you, they brought it to you, right? There's nothing new under the sun. We just do it online now. Okay, so here's what I want you to remember. The mall, Piggly Wiggly, and then there was a guy named Sylvan Goldman in Oklahoma who owned a whole bunch of Piggly Wigglies. And he noticed something. He watched the shoppers. And when the shoppers filled up their baskets, they stopped shopping. So he said, we got, we got to figure out a way for these people to have bigger baskets. So he took two baskets, put them on a folding chair, and with the help of a, a mechanic named Good uh, Young, Ron Young, he put wheels on the folding chair and created the very first shopping cart that revolutionized shopping. So here's what I want you to remember. The mall, Piggly Wiggly, shopping cart. Okay? We'll come back to that. I want to look at our passage in Philippians chapter 4. This is our theme passage. We've been looking at this for a couple of weeks now. Uh, it's in verses 8 and 9, and oh, here it is on the screen. Great. I want you to say this with me. You've been talking all morning. Let's talk a little bit more. Say it with me. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. All right, I want to ask you six questions, okay? I, I don't want you to answer out loud. Do not answer this out loud, these questions out loud. Silence of your own heart, and because I want you to be completely honest, and you can be, because you already know it. Can't, no need to hide from yourself, and you can't hide from God. That's been tried. Didn't work. Adam and Eve. So just answer in the silence of your own heart. Are you ready? Here we go. Question number one. Do things that once shocked you barely register as offensive anymore? You used to, used to like, whoa, and now it's like, hmm. Do you tell jokes that 10 years ago you wouldn't even laugh at? Do you watch movies or television shows or online videos now that would have made you uncomfortable 10 years ago? Are there things in your internet history that you would be mortified if anybody else saw? You know, you're riding in the car sometimes and you're listening to the music. Would you listen to your favorite music, your jam, if your mother was riding with you? And question number six, when was the last time you blushed? When was the last time you blushed? Here's where those questions are headed. Paul said, whatever is pure, think about such things. Think, meditate visualize, imagine those things. Whatever is pure, things that are right and good and clean and holy. You could disagree with me on this, but I think it's harder now than it ever has been 
to think pure thoughts. It's harder because we are receiving more impure input. And I'm, I'm going to guess that there are a lot of things that used to raise our eyebrows, the things that once shocked us that just don't anymore. Maybe it's because we're more sophisticated, but I don't really think so. I think we've gotten used to it. I think we've gotten acclimated to impurity. We've gotten comfortable with it. We've gotten used to it. How did that happen? It happened through story. Let me read you a quote from a psychologist named Pam Rutledge uh, in an article in Psychology Today. Listen to what she said. She said, stories are how we think. They're how we make meaning of life. Call them schemas, scripts, cognitive maps, mental models, metaphors, narratives, doesn't matter. Stories are how we explain how things work, how we make decisions, how we justify our decisions, how we persuade others, how we understand our place in the world, create our identities, and here's the big one. Stories are how we define and teach social values. Stories have enormous power. And for the last 80 years, we've been shaped by stories. and We didn't even know it was happening. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how stories have power to stick. If I tell you that sometimes God selects the right person and puts them in the right place at the right time to accomplish his purposes, you'll go, hmm, it's pretty good. Then tomorrow, you won't even remember that I said that. It's a, you would agree with it today, and tomorrow you'd say, you know, you said something yesterday, but I can't remember what it was. But what if I tell you a story? What if I told you that once, a long time ago, in a land far, far away, there was a kingdom? And in that kingdom, there was a little girl who was orphaned, raised by a family member. And she grew up to be the most beautiful woman in the kingdom. So beautiful that she won the hand of the king. He married her, made her his queen. But what the king didn't know, nor did any of his administration, was that the, the queen was a part of a hated and persecuted minority. And there was a man in the king's administration that hated that minority so much that he wanted to get rid of him. And so he went to the king and he said, King, you've got some people in this country who don't worship our gods. They don't pay their taxes. They're responsible for just about everything that's wrong in the kingdom. If you'll just sign this piece of paper, I'll get rid of them for you. And the king said, okay. What nobody remembered was that the queen was a part of that minority. And so she used her power and her position and her influence to expose what Haman was doing and save her people. And to this day, in February and March, the Jews remember the courage of Esther at the Feast of Purim. You'll remember that story because stories have power to shape us. We just read that one in our uh, In the Word in 2018 effort. Uh, if you're behind in that, me too. Okay? Just pick up where we are and keep going. But the Bible is full of stories like that. And they shape us, and they influence us, and they, they make us who we are. And that's why, the power of story, that's why I think that we no longer raise an eyebrow at things that once made us wince. You, you know, did you know that half the adults in the United States are not married? Half the adults in the United States who, who could be married have chosen not to be married. Now, I, I bet there are a lot of reasons for that, but you know what I think one of the reasons might be? Because for decades now, movies and television and novels have told us the story that marriage is hard and marriage is awful. So no wonder about half the people don't want to try it. You ever notice that in just about every television show, two people meet each other, kind of hit it off, and before you know it, they're in bed together? Where, where did we ever get the idea that, that you meet somebody, you kind of like them, so you just go to bed together the next day or two? Where did we ever learn that from the stories that we've been taught over and over again, television, movies, novels? 
Have you noticed that satisfying same-sex relationships seem to outnumber healthy heterosexual marriages about 20 to 1 in the television shows that you watch, in the movies that entertain us, in the books that we read, in the music that we listen to? These stories, we've been hearing these for decades now. We, we think, and this is what I, I hear a lot of Christian people say, we think, man, things just changed overnight. No, they didn't. For the last 60, or year, 60 years or more, maybe 80, we've been, we've been feeding on these stories, and they eventually changed what we think and what we believe and how we live. Now, in a sense, it has always been hard to keep a pure heart. I mean, it's, it's dirty out there. It always has been. Even the Bible says that total purity is impossible. Proverbs 20 verse 9 asks, and it's a rhetorical question, so don't answer this one either. Who can say, I have kept a pure heart? Who can say that I am clean and without sin? So it's, it's, it's not like the moral dystopia that we're living in is new. King David didn't lust after Bathsheba because of the internet. Still, the Bible calls us to purity. Paul told his young protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 5, 22, keep yourself pure, which we expect because Timothy's a guy, right? But Paul told Titus to tell the older women to train the younger women to be self-controlled and pure. It's for men and for women. Purity is. So yeah, we live in an impure environment. And yes, it rubs off. You spend some time in the yard, you're going to track in some dirt. But if we accept the culture's standards, are you listening if we accept the culture's standards, we stop being the people of God, which is exactly what Paul feared when he wrote, Timothy, uh, wrote Titus. Let me read you something in Titus chapter 2. I want you to flip over there with me. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Really powerful passage. I think we've looked at this recently when uh, we did a Lord's Supper meditation, but it's a great passage for what it tells us about grace. Uh, he said, Paul says in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. It offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself, a people who are eager to do good, people of his very own. Let, I want to show you three things in that passage. First of all, grace is a teacher. And one of the things grace wants to teach is you and me how to say no. No to ungodliness and worldly passions. We spent all last week talking about God's marvelous grace and how God's grace gives us the righteousness we cannot earn. No way we could ever earn it. We couldn't beg for it. We couldn't borrow it. We couldn't steal it. We couldn't buy it. The only way we're going to be made right, be made right before God is because of God's grace shown for us on the cross through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And I want you to believe that and I want you to embrace it and I want you to live it. But that's not all grace does. It takes care of our guilt but it doesn't just get the guilt out. Grace wants to train you and me to stop doing the things that make us guilty. Grace wants to deal with your guilt. It wants to get rid of it. But it wants to teach us to stop doing the things that make us guilty. Grace is not a license to do whatever you want. It's not a bungee cord that keeps you from hitting the pavement when you dive off the bridge into the cultural chasm of impurity, it's a teacher that sets high standards. It makes stringent demands, and it requires careful living. Grace is a teacher. That's the first thing. Second thing, regardless of what the culture accepts, God expects his people to live godly lives, to live pure lives. Look, right and wrong are not moving targets. Now, they are in the culture. In this culture, it's kind of hard to figure out because things that used to be vices are now rights, you know? Things that used to be virtues are now wrong. It's no wonder that people are so confused in our culture because the targets keep moving for the culture. 
but not for God. I want to urge you as you live your life in, in the, the arena where, where Paul tells Titus all this takes place is this present age. Purity is for this present age. I want to urge you to, to be very careful about choosing what is right and what is wrong and making those decisions and be sure that you're always going here to the Word of God because this doesn't change. Culture can't make its mind up. It changes its mind more than the Trump administration changes cabinet members, all right? But God's Word doesn't change, all right? Third thing, Jesus gave himself to make us pure. That's verse 14. He, he died for us to purify us. I want, I want, to give you, I want you to remember this tomorrow when you face a temptation. When you and I intentionally expose ourselves to things that are not pure, we are undoing the work of the cross. If Jesus died to make me pure, then when I do things that, that put impure thoughts and ideas into my mind, then I am undoing what Jesus did for me on the cross. So what does it mean to be pure? Can you remember them all? Bigly Wiggly and the shopping cart. The world we live in is the mall. Mall of the world. There are very many wonderful and exciting things out there in this grand mall. It's beautifully designed. It's well landscaped. It's filled with mostly friendly people. I mean, there's some rotten things and people here and there, but for the most part, this world is a glorious spectacle of ideas and images and sights and sounds and lifestyles and customs and stories. It's beautiful. And you and I are pushing a shopping cart right down the grand aisle of this great mall. And that shopping cart is your heart. It's your soul. It's your mind. And on each side of the aisle, there are hundreds of shops and stores and boutiques. And just like that first Piggly Wiggly, we get to put whatever we want into our shopping carts, into our hearts, into our minds, into our souls. We have the freedom to roam the aisles, to go into any shop, any store, any boutique, stop off at, at any counter, and put whatever we want into those shopping carts. So here's the definition of purity. Purity means that you only put into your shopping cart, your heart, your mind, your soul. You only put into your shopping cart ideas and images, sights and sounds, lifestyles, customs, and stories that bring honor to God. Look, we can't change what's stocked on the shelves. We, we can't do that. People tried that. It, it never works. You can't censure what's up on the shelves. But you can make decisions about what goes into your shopping cart, what goes into your heart, what goes into your mind. That's where you and I have control. I want to tell you one more story. It's a little like the one I told you earlier um, about the orphan girl who grew up to be a beautiful woman and became the queen to save her people because it involves palace intrigue, but that's about as far as these two stories go in terms of having something in common. This one begins like this. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. She was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. Now, if you'd never heard the story of David, you kind of know where that story's headed. You know the direction. She becomes pregnant. David tries to cover it up. In fact, he has her husband killed, has him murdered in order to cover up his crime. And then the consequences that David faces are enormous. Two sons die. A daughter is ravished. Another son is guilty of murder and rebellion. David comes this close to losing his kingdom, and it's almost a tragic end. And then something happens to redeem all that. David confesses. Psalm 51 is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. It's where David 
says, I have sinned. In fact, uh, this Wednesday night at the spring, uh, our instrumental service, we're going to meet up here, and, and that service is going to be focused on Psalm 51. The reason I want to look at that one as we close this morning is because I suspect some of us are thinking about what's in our shopping carts. And we're thinking, you know what? David's descent started with one impure thought, and I got a shopping cart full of them. What's going to become of me? Well, I want you to imagine something. When we had Nathan and Kara up here a minute ago, and we had Oliver, wouldn't it be awesome if you could somehow recover the innocence that you saw in Oliver? If you could be innocent like a little baby again? You can be. You can be. Paul told Titus that Jesus died to purify for himself a people who are eager to do good. You can have that innocence again. Let me read you what David wrote as he contemplated his own sin and imagined the possibility of being innocent again. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Are you praying this with David right now? Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Pray this prayer with David. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You can recover that innocence again. You can be careful about what goes into your heart and your mind. Make sure that all that goes in there brings glory to God. Let's sing again together. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O I would like to have all of our students, if you're going to, if you're already started or going to school, stand up. I'd like for our teachers, administrators, school employees to stand up. Nobody going to school? Nobody teaching? There we go. Stand up, teachers, homeschool teachers. These are the people I want you to be praying for, okay? Because they're starting something new this year, brand new year brand new struggles, brand new opportunities. And I want us to pray over them right now. As we, this is going to be our closing prayer, okay? This will be our closing prayer this morning. We just want to pray over you guys. We love you. We want you to be safe. We want you to be good. We want you to be pure and innocent. We want our teachers to be safe, our administrators to be safe and wise. And so let's lift them up in prayer. Let's pray. God, 
You see these folks that are standing here, these moms and dads, these teachers, these administrators, these principals, these students, we care about them, we love them. And every year it seems there's some tragedy that happens at a school and so we are asking, we are praying for you to keep our kids safe this year. Keep our kids safe in their classrooms, on their campuses, our teachers, our administrators, all the school employees, God, put, pr protect those places from anyone or anything that would hurt them. God, I pray for our, uh, our administrators that you'd give them wisdom as they try to create environments that are conducive to learning. I pray for our, our teachers that you would give them insight into each student, that they'd be able to get through to that student with the knowledge and the, the thinking skills needed for those kids to be successful in life. I pray for our homeschool moms and dads who are the administrators and teachers in those environments. Give them great wisdom and insight into their kids. And I pray for our boys and girls, our students. God, I ask you again to keep them safe. I ask you, you would enable them to be a light shining in the darkness, to be a city set on a hill, to be the salt of the earth, so that your glory would come through them and be a blessing to that school. God, give them a mission in their schools to go forth and be Jesus there to people who need them. Protect them from influences that would lead them away from you. Put people in their lives that will draw them closer to you and help them take their discipleship into their schools and change them for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, have a great week. Thanks for being here this morning.